Uh, welcome to class number six of our series from uh, Creation Science Evangelism CSE Class 103. We're covering uh, how the evolution theory has affected the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, Nazism, all sorts of things, and it's going to take us a while to get through this, <laughs> this whole session. We left off uh, last week talking about Karl Marx, who wrote the Ten Planks of the Communist Manifesto. We talked about plank number one, abolish private property. You need to understand, everything Karl Marx did and thought after he got believing in evolution, but everything seemed to be anti-God. Like, if God's for it, I'm against it. That seemed to be kind of his attitude. And his, everything he did in his ten planks of the Communist Manifesto was, un, was against what Scripture teaches, unconstitutional, according to the American Constitution, most of these things are. And so what we're going to cover tonight on income tax it was going to be uh, surprising to some, and others will say, yay, go get them, Brother Hovind. Some other Christians might say, oh, you shouldn't talk about that. Well, my philosophy is everybody should obey the law, including the government. <clears throat> right? Real simple. I have not filed any income tax in 28 years. Uh, if there's a law requiring me to file some, I would like to see it. I have the entire Internal Revenue Code right here thoroughly marked up, indexed. You're welcome to check out anything. I know the subject pretty well. I've been a long time student of this topic, as my son would be glad to tell you. This is something I read a lot on because I want very badly to be right with God. The Bible says, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. I agree. It does not say render to Fred that which is Caesar's. Okay, if something belongs to Caesar, I'll give it to him. I'm not against that at all. So what we're going to cover tonight, just briefly, because uh, uh, I, I have read enormous amounts of information on this and could talk for years on it. However, I have other dragons to slay. I don't have time to fight this one too long because to me there's other things, other topics that are more important. Karl Marx invented the, what we call the graduated income tax. The more you make, the more they take. It was Karl Marx's idea. He knew what would happen. As people got richer, they would find loopholes and end up paying nothing. The poor people wouldn't make enough to pay anything, and the purpose of the income tax is to wipe out the middle class. The middle class ends up paying the burden of the income tax. The poor people pay very little, the rich people pay almost none. So <clears throat> his idea was a heavy progressive, that's a key word, income tax, which means the more you make, the more they take. On my website, drdino.com, under frequently asked questions, uh, we have a question, it's about number question number 40, but we add new numbers all the time, so it may not stay number 40, about uh, <clears throat> how the IRS is tied into uh, communism, socialism, uh, and evolution, ultimately. <clears throat> See, God's method was very simple in Scripture. Each person paid a certain amount. Actually, uh, in some cases, there were instances where they paid 10%. 10% went to support the Levites, the, the, the Christians of the day, and 10% went to support the government. Just flat tax. Everybody pays 10%. Okay? Karl Marx said, no, if you have a graduated income tax, then this will slowly discourage people from being honest. They'll figure out some way to to lie, cheat, steal if they can, you know. And I, don't, I sure don't want to be dishonest. It'll also encourage people um, that get to the top to look for loopholes, and it's, this is gonna, actually going to wipe out the middle class. See, under communism, you can only have two classes of people, the very rich and the very poor. Go to just about any country where they have communism, where it's been in uh, control for a long time, and you'll see this, this very th same thing. There aren't three classes, there's two the super rich and the extremely poor. There are many good websites uh, that can give you information on this topic. George Hansen, former uh, representative from Idaho uh, in Congress, he wrote this book to harass our people. He said this is the purpose of the IRS, to harass our people. The purpose of the IRS is to gather information, not to gather money. None of the money goes to support the federal government. It goes to pay the debt the interest on the national debt. We'll get into more of that in a minute on money. The best book I know on the topic, if you want to get into more, is Otto Skinner's book, uh, The Biggest Tax Loophole of All. Very simply, he says, look, the code says clearly, if you are liable for a tax, you should pay it. Read your 1040 form very carefully this t next time when you fill one out. It says, you must file a form for every tax for which you are liable. There's the key. Has Congress made you liable? Here are all the laws where Congress has said these, the following people are liable to pay. None of them apply to an individual earning money in most normal ways that people earn money. If you are manufacturing alcohol, tobacco, or firearms, you're supposed to pay. I can show you the code on that. If, you're, uh, if you have oil wells in a foreign country, then you're supposed to pay. Just If, if I said, uh, 
Jeff, I will trade you my shirt for your shirt. That's not income for you. It's not income for me. We trade it. If you say, Brother Hoven, I will trade you 40 hours of my time for 400 bucks, that's not income for either one of us either. Now, if a doctor has gone to school all these years and he thinks his time is worth $200 an hour, and he says, hey, I'll trade you 15 minutes of my time for 50 bucks for an appointment, that's not income. That's a trade. And Congress has ruled on, and judges and courts have ruled on this many times. That's exactly correct, okay? Income is corporate profits. So what they've done, see, an individual earning money just, you know, trading his, way, tra trading his time or, or labor for money is not income and is not taxable. So it's been real slick the way they've done this. They've given every, every person on the, in the United States, at least, has a straw man that they have created for you, which is a corporation. Now, corporations are taxable. Real people would not be. And it's really slick how they've done this. We'll get into more of that in a minute. But if you want more on the website, um, on our website, drdano.com, there's about a 30-page letter, and we add to it all the time. Uh, you might want to get a hold of Joe Sweet's book, uh, Good News, Bad News. Good news for Form 1040 filers, bad news for the IRS. It's voluntary. He goes through all the laws here. Uh, Erwin Schiff, a few things I would differ with Erwin Schiff, but he's written prolifically on the topic, how anyone can stop paying income tax, the Social Security swindle, how you can drop out, the biggest con, the federal government is fleecing you. Erwin Schiff has written <laughs> lots and lots of books on the topic and is very knowledgeable. I think he's got a few things uh, incorrect in what he's doing, but... Um, He's, uh, he's successful, okay, it works. Peter Kershaw's book, In Caesar's Grip, is one of the most riveting books I've read in some time on how churches have gotten trapped by becoming 501c3 corporations. See, the church, the Congress shall make no law, First Amendment, affecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. You know, I like to ask them sometimes, what part of no law don't you understand? You know, it says no law. Now, if a statute is, if a county uh, passes a law that says we want churches to be taxed or whatever, just because the county passes a law, the courts have been clear on this. Uh, 16 uh, American jurisprudence, um, I can look up the code for you, I've got it uh, on my desk, but it says very clearly, if a law is unconstitutional, the unconstitutionality of that law starts the moment the law is passed. You don't have to wait till it's proven to be unconstitutional. If it goes against the Constitution, it's, it's not a law at all. It's no, and you're not under no obligation to obey it. So if, if a church gets incorporated, now they've put their head in a noose because now they have, to, they have to abide by all sorts of rules and regulations because they're not really a church. They're now a corporation. The government gives corporations the right to exist. And that's what um, has happened in the last hundred years. Many churches have become incorporated. If a church is not incorporated, it's just a real, true New Testament church. They answer directly to God. The church does not have permission from God to give away God's authority. So since our ministry here, Creation Science Evangelism, is under the uh, auspices of Faith Baptist Fellowship, an a unincorporated church, I, I, I don't have God's permission to, to put God under some other sovereign. Okay? It's a sovereignty issue. If you got on board a Chinese ship out here in the harbor, you're under Chinese law. As soon as you cross over that railing of the ship and board the ship, you're under Chinese law, even if it's an American harbor. Um, <clears throat> the church is sovereign because God is sovereign and we're, we're doing God's work, so we're under His authority. As long as we're under His authority, we're fine. If a church, though, becomes incorporated, which 99% of them have done here in Pensacola, even, and all over the country, they are now no longer truly a church. You heard the preachers get up and say, the head of the church is Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah? Not sure it's not. The head of your church is the federal government. They give rights to create corporations. And if, you know, why do you ask permission from them to exist? Which is why a true church, um, we can go off on a lot of rabbit trails here, and I'm sure we'll get a thousand phone calls. A true church should not get building permits. They should build better than the code. Uh, obviously, you want to be safe. We're not trying to get out of anything or trying to save any money, but you simply cannot ask permission from a county to do something that belongs to God's church. Now, people argue about that. Now, the, 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 uh, our country was started 225 years ago by people who had the attitude of, uh, you know, King George simply 
is not the authority. I mean, church is split over should we be loyal to King George or should we, you know, do what's right. And good people split over these issues. And I, I've read lots on the topic and I certainly don't want to, you know, uh, I want very badly to be right with God. I don't want to disobey scripture. I don't know of any scripture I'm disobeying. I don't know of any law I'm disobeying on this topic. But I have not filed any income tax in 28 years. Uh, I don't keep any records. Uh, I'm not required to. There's no law requiring me to. If I did keep records, and if I get, did give that to the government and fill out a form, 1040 form, under penalty of perjury, you know, I hereby declare the following information is correct, that form becomes their evidence to prosecute me. In the first place, the 14th Amendment outlawed slavery. Does the IRS pay you to keep records for them? No, no. Now, why does that sound like slavery to me? <laughs> they're, you're doing their work for them and they're not paying you? Fifth Amendment says you're, uh, you, can't, you don't have to offer evidence to incriminate yourself. Okay. Well, how do they know how much money you made? You told them when you filled out that form. They're going to audit one out of 3,000 returns, generally. Mine's not in the pile. My chances of being audited are zero out of 1,000 or 3,000 or 10,000. They just won't do it. If they come to your door, there's all sorts of things you can do there, which is, again, uh, a long, long story. I don't, I'm not the least bit afraid of the subject. I've read thoroughly on it. I'll go with anybody to the IRS and say, here, arrest me. If I'm doing something wrong, show me the law. I'm not breaking any laws. I'm trying very hard to obey God. But I also don't want to waste a lot of time on this topic. So I want to take 10 minutes, explain my position, and then leave. I'm sure we're going to get 1,000 phone calls. We've already got them. We have a 30-page letter on my website, or we'll send it to you in writing, you know, a typed-out version if you don't uh, have access to the Internet. And then on the, in that letter are lists of, oh, probably 20 people who can help you with the details should you decide to, you know, retain your rights as, as a true American citizen. We'll get into more on who's an American citizen later. What I want to cover in this class, though, is Karl Marx invented this. Uh, Reagan, in one of his speeches, mentioned that uh, Karl Marx was the founder of our income tax system in America. Interesting confession. Keeping in mind that Karl Marx was a strong believer in evolution and wanted to do anything he could to go against this book. See, according to this book, ownership of private property is extremely important. You can't really have freedom unless you own your own property. Um, if you're renting or... Um, if you don't own the property, you really can't have the type of freedom that God envisioned for his people, which is why he had the system of, of laws. Let's go on here now. <clears throat> uh, so check the website if you want more information on that, or if you want to read some of my books, you're welcome to give me a call. I can tell you where to get them. You want to mention the book Hush Money? The book Hush Money is the shortened version of this book. This is an extremely thorough book dealing with churches and how they should not be incorporated and what to do if you are and how the, the problems that come in. And it, I really, really enjoyed it. Peter Kershaw lives in Branson, Missouri. Um, he also has two chapters out of this book, which he's put in a little booklet form called Hush Money, which we sell. We sell both of them on our uh, website or in our, in our ministry there. So it's just a short version of the big, of this bigger story. Okay. Item number three in Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto was abolish the rights of inheritance. Item number four was confiscation of property rights. Item number five was a central bank. Now, you need to understand the history a little bit here. Back in 18, 1800s, banking was, a, was, it, it was a key, a, a big problem. The, the Bible says very clearly um, that the love of money is the root of all evil. There have always been people who wanted to control the entire money supply, and with that they know they can really control the country. The central bank was created in America in 1913. This book here, The Creature from Jekyll Island, is an awesome book if you really want to get into what happened. Jekyll Island is a resort island off the coast of Georgia. A bunch of super rich gazillionaires had a secret meeting there back in 19, 10, 11, 12, 13, somewhere in there. And they came up with a way to control the money of America. They said, what we want is a system of banks. The banks will issue the currency. And by us issuing the money, we can control um, and create inflation. We can create uh, uh, depressions whenever we want. But we don't want the people to know what's going on. So we have to give it a name that will make it sound like it is part of the government. So they give it a name called Federal Reserve. There's nothing federal about it, okay? It's not part of the federal government. 
The Federal Reserve is a private banking cartel of super rich guys who control the currency of America. It's really strange. The United States government prints these bills, costs them about three cents a piece to print one. They give them to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve rents it back to the United States for 20 bucks plus interest. Congress has the authority, according to the Constitution, to coin money. And the word coin is very important. You coin, you stamp gold and silver into coins. And it was cl clearly spelled out how many ounces you know, or drams of gold, grams of gold would be considered one dollar, et cetera, et cetera. And as long as we were on the gold or silver standard, there were very few problems as far as runaway inflation and stuff like that. What's happened now that we have paper, they've taken away our gold and given us paper. The next step will be take away the paper and give you electronic signal, which costs them nothing. That'll be a plastic card, debit or credit card, and the next step beyond that is a little chip, which goes in your hand. <coughs> right now, you go to the store, they run your groceries over the scanner, you hand them your paper, and they take it, right? The day will come very soon when they're going to say, I'm sorry, we don't take uh, paper, we only take credit, credit card, electronic, money. And then, it, it won't be far on the, on the heels of that, that it'll be, I'm sorry, if you don't have a chip, we just can't sell you anything. We're not equipped to take. The cash register will be gone at the store. Probably the clerk will be gone. Checkout lady. Just like the commercial they've had on TV a bunch of times. The guy's walking through the store, stuffing things in his coat, you know. How many seen that? The guy's got the big trench coat on as he's walking through. He's putting all kinds of things in his pockets. As he heads toward the door, the security guard is walking to meet him. And as he's just about to go out the door, the security guard grabs his arm and says, Excuse me, sir, you forgot your receipt. Have you seen that commercial? Oh, it's incredible. That's where we're headed. A cashless society. And it's going to sound, wow, this is great. Look, I don't have to carry my wallet. You can't have checks you know, stolen. There are no credit cards. And It's going to sound great, but you're going to lose every bit of privacy. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913 uh, here in America. The Bible says, love of money, root of all evil. So whoever controls the money has the power. And this goes right back to the evolution philosophy. Karl Marx knew if uh, communism was to succeed, you have to have a central bank. The Bible says, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now you probably all think you have some money, but you don't. You have a debt note. This is a $20 debt note. This is not money. This is a symbol that we are in debt to the bankers, $20. This is a reminder. This is the note to remind us that it's due. And we owe them, I don't know, some people argue about how much it really is. Estimates range up to $17 trillion. Who knows how much it really is. But for centuries, the alchemists had tried to find a way to turn lead into gold. Lead is cheap. Gold is expensive. They were looking for ways in the laboratory to turn lead into gold. And the alchemy, thinking, you know, alchemists, they slowly became today the chemists. And chemistry, of course, is a great science. I enjoy chemistry, but alchemists tried to figure out a way to turn lead into gold. They never did succeed. Okay? The bankers have discovered a way to do it. They start wars, and they finance both sides. We'll loan money to both sides of this battle. Okay? When the lead stops flying, the gold rolls in as interest on the national debt. Because now both countries owe money to, guess who? The bankers. So in one sense, they don't care who wins, because they're going to collect interest either way. Sometimes they try to control and you know, make the right side win so that they'll make sure they get the interest out of, out of both sides. During World War II, U.S. debt rose nearly 600%. Japanese debt rose 1,348% during the war. Um, French debt rose almost 600%. Canadian debt rose 417%. Guess who we owe this money to? These bankers. There's several families of super rich gazillionaires. They have nearly all the money in the world, and they want it all. They have most of it. Now they want the rest of it. And everybody think, right now, so everybody's so blinded, they think, wow, I'm doing fine, i got lots of money in the bank. No, no, you don't have any money in the bank. You have debt notes in the bank. I'll show you how it worked. Nehemiah said that we're, we're in trouble because we have borrowed money 
We put our sons and daughters into bondage to be servants. Right now the national debt is such that our great, 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 great grandchildren won't be able to pay it off. And without getting into all the, we can talk for, there's whole seminars for years and years on the topic of what is real money and, you know, how to fix the national debt problem. Lincoln decided rather than borrow money from these bankers, he would print uh, treasury notes. See, the Congress has the authority to print or coin money, to coin money they do. So Lincoln printed these greenbacks, which have no debt attached to them. Why should we print money and then rent it from these bankers? Why doesn't Congress just print money? Why do the bankers have to be involved at all? Well, the reason they're involved is because the United States that we are dealing with here, when it says United States on here, that's not the real United States. That's the United States Corporation. That's the corporate United States, not the real United States. We'll get into that in a minute here. But uh, we traded our real money, silver and gold, for paper. Soon, those who control all this are going to make us trade the paper for plastic, and then the plastic for an embedded microchip. That's apparently the way it's going to go. The Bible prophesied in the last days, of course, you would have to receive a mark to buy or sell. The Greek word for mark, uh, uh, Joe, I mean, uh, Sanders, uh, Carl Sanders, yeah, <laughs> a friend of mine from Arkansas, um, he helped invent the little microchip. And now he's a Christian. He travels all over and speaks against you know, what's happening, it's warning people what's going on. Uh, Dean uh, Martin here in Pensacola has quite a seminar on the microchip and really stays up to date on what's happening. You want to go in my office and get those microchips, Eric? If you sit at my desk on the right-hand side, I think they're, they're taped on the side of my desk on the upper part. Bring a couple microchips out here. I'll need those in a minute. Okay. I want you to look at this five, uh, $5 Federal Reserve note. I have it in my wallet. This is from... 1928. Hey, Jeff, would you get this uh, and read this, uh, read this right here out loud to everybody? 1928, $5 Federal Reserve note. Redeemable in gold on demand at the United States Treasury or in gold or lawful money at any Federal Reserve Bank. Yeah, thank you, sir. Now, you better watch this carefully. The Federal Reserve had only been going now for about 15 years. It was started in 1913. People were nervous about this Federal Reserve back then, and they should have been. <laughs> These are the bad guys, right? It says, this note is redeemable in gold on demand at any United States Treasury. So I could have gone in and said, here, I want $5 worth of gold. Give me my $5 gold piece. The argument that was used was, you know, gold is awful heavy to carry around in your pocket. Uh, let's... Uh, you know, let's give you a piece of paper to carry, and we'll keep the gold in the bank for you. We'll, we'll, we'll warehouse it for you. Ah, thank you, sir. Here's uh, one of the little microchips about the size of a grain of rice. That's the chip, as you will see, coming soon. Yeah, let's see if I can get a background where people can see that through that plastic bag. There. Black backgrounds, that make it worse? Yellow background. There we go. Little bitty chip, about the size of a grain of rice. Dean Martin came here and spoke to my staff here on the back porch, and uh, he put one of these little chips under his arm, and he set up his laptop computer with a little sensor, about the size of a pack of cigarettes, plugged into the back of his computer. And he just walked past that sensor. As soon as he walked past, up on the screen of the computer came his name, address, social security number, bank account number, I mean, all of his files. The chip only holds uh, a little alphanumeric number. It doesn't hold all this information, but it, it's the number. The number then triggers the computer, look up that file, and up comes everything on that person. They're getting technology better and better and better where they can read these farther and farther away. This little card, see, Steve, do you have your uh, military mark card? You know how much information is kept in a military mark card? You have yours there, right? Really? The military is going to be the ones that they do this to first because they have a little more control over them. The next step, though, is make it for all the civilians. This is just a blank plastic card. I wrote Dean Martin's phone number on there. But uh, this is actually a smart card. There's a computer chip in here. Dean? Yeah, Dean, yeah, you can see the access to it on here on the mark card. Is it 
unreal, the technology that's going on in these things. They can store enormous amounts of information in here. And you guys that are in the military, mark my words, uh, no pun intended, the next step is you no longer have one of these cards. I don't know how long it's going to last. Probably not very long, another year or a few more years. And they'll say, if you join the military, you have to get a little chip under your skin. In your hand or your forehead. So that we can find you in case you're shot down. You know, there'll be some excuse, I'm sure, to make it worth doing. But that's, that's what will happen. There's actually a computer card here, a computer uh, circuit in this little card. You can call Dean Martin in Pensacola, 850-455-5011. If you want more information on the chip, because he speaks on that. But back to the money. What is money? <clears throat> well, this says, I can redeem this in gold. Redeem means trade it in, buy back. I can redeem it for gold at any United States Treasury or in gold or lawful money. Well, you mean this is not lawful money? I have to trade it in for lawful money? Isn't that what they're telling me? They're saying, hey, you can trade this in for lawful money anytime you want. Then in 1933, they called the gold in. March 6, 1933, Roosevelt declared to Congress that a governor to, of Congress of Governors that a national state of emergency existed. Who remembers what's going on in 1933 in America? Depression. depression. The depression was purposely caused in 1929, October 29. They purposely crashed the economy because they controlled the money through the Federal Reserve System. The economy, the depression was deliberately engineered. Then, when people had suffered for a few years, they said, boy, have we got a deal for you. We've got the solution to your problems. Everybody come down and get a little number <coughs> called a Social Security number. That's when it was introduced, during the depression. Otherwise, people would have never got taken a number. By the way, Social Security is also voluntary, okay? Uh, and I'll get a thousand calls for that. Just read my website, please. It explains it all on there. He declared to the, to the governors, he said, fellas, we have a state of emergency. The economy is falling apart. And he knew full well that it had been caused deliberately and could be stopped at any time. All they got to do is loosen up the money supply, let more money out. If they want to cause a depression, you tighten up the money supply. There's just not enough available out there. Everybody says, boy, I'd like to buy a house, but you know, I just, I just don't have any money. But it's in all the hardware stores. Well, nobody's buying stuff anymore. Lumber companies, well, nobody's buying our lumber, and it just trickles down very quickly and crashes the economy. So, Roosevelt said, we have an emergency. I need special powers. I would like you governors to go back to your people and tell them that I need to have the authority to issue executive orders to fight war. See, during wartime, the Constitution is suspended, and the president can issue an executive order. How many have heard of executive orders before? Been quite a few of those flying out of the White House the last 10 years, haven't there? Um, so they said, yep, we'll go back and recommend to the people that uh, you be given emergency powers only as long as the emergency exists. So they declared a state of emergency in the mid-1930s, gave the president the power to issue executive orders in order to fight the enemy, which was the economy, which was a paper tiger. They had created it themselves, okay, created this enemy. Roosevelt said, now these, uh, this is only to last during the, during the state of emergency. Well, guess what? That was mid-1930s. It has never been lifted. We are still under state of emergency. Right now. What? 70 years later. So in 1933, March 9th, Congress voted to give the President of the United States and to the Treasury of, Secretary of the Treasury the emergency powers sanction to wage war through executive orders. The 1917 Trading with the Enemy Act was amended to include citizens. In other words, you can be a citizen of the United States and still be an enemy of the United States if you own gold. Anybody that owns gold is considered an enemy of the United States because, after all, the economy is hurting and the government needs the gold. Turn your gold in. We'll give you paper for it. And, you know, you keep this paper. We'll keep your gold. And if you don't, you're an enemy. You can be arrested. You can be arrested for having gold. Follow the yellow brick road. Remember that, okay? From Wizard of Oz, OZ, abbreviation for ounces, for gold. That movie was all about the same thing. So they declared the people enemies of the state if they owned gold. 
Now, here we have a Federal Reserve note from 1934. Let's see, Jeff, would you like to read what that says to us here? 1934 Federal Reserve note. Read that good and loud so we can get on the microphone here. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or at any Federal Reserve Bank. There we go. Thank you, sir. Notice it no longer says I can trade it in for gold. Did you catch that? 1928, you can trade it in for gold or lawful money. Now they just say you can trade it in for lawful money. Well, I'm still a little confused here. What is lawful money? If this isn't it, what, what can I trade it in for? One guy sent in a five, one, one, of, one of these $5 Federal Reserve notes. He sent it into the Treasury and said, uh, would you please redeem this for lawful money? They sent him back a Treasury note. Now, the Treasury notes have red ink on the seal. You don't see many of those anymore, okay, but they used to be out. I remember as a kid, I don't have one. I, I, might, I may have one in my coin collection, but Treasury note. And the Treasury note said the same thing. You can redeem this for lawful money. So he sent it back. He said, please redeem this for lawful money. They sent him a letter back. It says, uh, please be advised, Congress has not decided what lawful money is. Well, that's just simply not true, okay? Lawful money is gold and silver. So I could trade this in for lawful money, they said. Now, in 1957, they were still issuing these. Notice the blue ink on the seal. The seal has blue ink. Now the seal has black ink, right? You can get them with red ink, blue ink, black ink. I'm not sure how many different kinds they create. This one is called a silver certificate. You can redeem this for $1 worth of silver. After all, you know, silver dollars are pretty heavy. They wear holes in your pocket. You don't want to carry all those silver coins. Let's give you a piece of paper. We'll hold your silver for you. Love of money, root of all evil, the Bible says. Keep that thought in mind. So, now... The money doesn't say redeemable for anything. It simply says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Well, what on earth is legal tender? It always reminds me of tinder, something you start a fire with, you know? <laughs> legal tender. What on earth is legal tender? What's happened to our money? Well, we don't have any more. Many people are, think, are duped into thinking that they're obligated to go along with what's happening without protest. It is such a complicated web that they have woven to trap us in uh, by taking away the gold and silver. We no longer have the ability to buy anything with real money. Suppose you had a truckload of counterfeit, I mean a truckload of Confederate money from the Civil War. What could you do with it? Wallpaper, Wallpaper your wall. <laughs> That's about it, right? Someday, very soon, this will be wallpaper. You can't eat it. You can't wear it. You can't build a house out of it. I'd take a bunch of them. You could, I suppose. Absolutely useless piece of paper with some ink on it. Somebody once said, the government of the United States is the only, people, only place I know where you can take a perfectly good commodity like paper, put some ink on it, and make it totally useless. Totally worthless. <laughs> what good is that going to be? Well, Again, we can go off on long rabbit trails there, but let me just give you the, the, the skinny version of what's going on. We, the people, <coughs> created the government. Kent E. Hoven, John Doe, etc., these are real people. We create government. Now, government is an artificial, non-living, fictitious, called a person. Okay, but I'll use the word person in quotes here. <coughs> government is an artificial, non-living, fictitious person. In person in quotes here. We created government. People say, what is government anyway? Well, it's, it's a consensus of what we the people want. The government owns, controls, regulates, taxes, assigns numbers to, fines, etc. Whatever it creates. See, if you create something, you own it. Uh, let's continue now with some more of our politically incorrect <laughs> information <laughs> from this class. Actually, it's politically correct. To everybody else, it's incorrect. Here's the basic principle. Whatever you create, you own it. You control it. It's the, the principle of ownership, okay? Since God created people, He owns us. We belong to Him. Our job is to find out what the boss wants and do it, okay? The people created government. 
So they're supposed to be public servants. How many have ever heard that expression before? Public servants, right? And they swear to uphold the Constitution and all that kind of stuff. Well, the government doesn't like the idea of being servant. They would like to be master. So they've got a really slick way that this has happened. And most of the folks even involved in government don't even know what's happened. A few do, okay? And enough do to know what's going on. But they decided to create artificial people. Turn to page 26 in this little booklet, which is Citizen's Rule Book. Uh, these are a dollar piece from our ministry. This is the whole Constitution to the United States and the Declaration of Independence and a very fascinating section on juries, jury nullification. If you're ever called in to be on a jury, and let's suppose your city passes a law that it's against the law to spit on the sidewalk, okay? And you think, that's a stupid law. You've got a right to spit on the sidewalk if you want. And so some guy's hauled in, and it's obvious he's guilty. They got photographs of him, videotape, he's, he's spat on the sidewalk, okay? But you as a juror think the law is wrong. After the court case, you sit there, you listen to everybody, give all their arguments. It's obvious, yep, the guy spit on the sidewalk. No question, he broke the law. However, the law is no good. All you do as a juror is vote not guilty. Now, it's obvious he's guilty of breaking the law, but the law is not constitutional or not good. So you simply vote not guilty. Your not guilty vote can nullify a bad law. Very few jurors know this. But this is a fascinating reading, the section on jury nullification. You might want to read that in case you ever get on a jury. Page 26. Let's see, Jan, English teacher for how long? How long have you been teaching English, Jan? A while, right? Okay. Would you look at the title on page 26? This is the Declaration of, the United States, Declaration of uh, Independence, okay? The Unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America. Now, as an English teacher, what do you see with that? Thirteen. There's now, now more now, but notice the word "united" is not capitalized. You see that? States is capitalized. See, states are sovereign. The fact that they united is just an adjective describing what they did. Okay? Or uh, yeah, the united is not capitalized. This is a critical issue here now. The real United States is with a small U, capital S. Here's how we got tricked in the last 70 years, okay? God created people. People created governments based on God's laws. America was built, founded on the laws that came from God, okay? These states then, the 13 states, got together and created a government called the United States of America. And they gave that government authority over a small section called Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, 10 miles by 10 miles in Maryland, Virginia. The Virginia side, during the Civil War, went with the South. So we lost half of the ground that the capital was supposed to be on. And I think it was Robert E. Lee's home was right there. And so during the war, they took a thousands and thousands of Yankee soldiers that were killed and buried them in Robert E. Lee's front yard. Turned it into a graveyard. The cemetery is still there today. What's the name of it? Arlington Cemetery. Robert E. Lee's front yard. <coughs> just so he wouldn't want to live there anymore. <laughs> you know, thousands of Yankee soldiers in his, in his front yard. Long story behind that, too. Anyway, the United States of America is supposed to be the servant to the states. They have no jurisdiction in the states without the state's permission. Now, the average county sheriff doesn't understand this. Some do, okay? But the federal government is not allowed to do anything without the county sheriff's permission. The sheriff of the county is boss, okay? And in Wyoming, there's numerous counties where they have told the federal government, do not come into our county. And this happens all over the United States. There are sheriffs who say, that you federal government, IRS agents, don't come in our county. You come to us first. You don't seize anybody's property. You don't take away anybody's car. You don't do nothing without our permission. That's why they always get the county sheriff involved, okay? The county sheriff could say, no, I don't want any federal agents at all in my, in my juris jurisdiction. Stay out. He could keep the FBI out. The county sheriff could. It's funny because you see all these movies where... Yeah, I'm FBI. I'm taking over here. Yeah. Oh, boy, I know. It's, it, we've all been conditioned up here. Okay. Now I have a red line on my drawing on purpose here because something... Well, this, is, this is a mirror. We're going to go through a mirror now because the United States went bankrupt in the early 30s. The bankers who control the money, 
Love of money, root of all evil. Say, look, fellas, you're bankrupt. Uh, we're calling in the note. We are taking over, and we're gonna. We don't want the people to panic. Everybody's worried now because of the depression. You know, times are pretty hard, so they're kind of busy thinking of other things. So they probably won't notice what's going on anyway. We're going to create a new corporation, and we're going to name it United States. But now it's all capital letters, and everybody thinks they're still in the same place. No, nope. you now live in a corporate United States, which is run, owned, controlled, regulated by these super rich people, which is exactly what they've wanted all along. The United States then created 50 state corporations. Big difference here. There are two Floridas, State of Florida and Florida State. One is the real real estate of Florida. The other, which happens to have the same boundaries, is the corporate Florida State. Same geographic boundaries, okay? People have argued that in many, many states, the boundaries of the corporate state was never defined. And so there's a whole argument there. You can chase that rabbit a long ways down the trail if you'd like. But FL, capital F, capital L, is the abbreviation for the corporate Florida. FLA is the abbreviation for the real Florida. It can be whichever one you'd like, okay? These... Rich folks also, had, as part of the master plan, created a person for each of the people. See, God created people, so he owns them. The government created persons, so they own them. The person they create is called a straw man. It has no brain. It's just a piece of paper that says this represents Kent Hovind. But the name is in all capital letters. Now, that person was created via the birth certificate. When your parents got a birth certificate for you, the hospitals will just about go nuts if you try to leave without getting a birth certificate because they're really under pressure to get those birth certificates because the birth certificate creates an artificial person. When that artificial person is created, the birth certificate then becomes worth some money. It can be bartered and sold and traded like, like commodities or cows or sheep or corn on the international market. And the president can say, man, we've got you know, X number of million new people in the United States that were born this year. We can borrow more money now against their birth certificates. They are the collateral. We are, the, the, the straw man becomes the uh, collateral for the national debt. So the bankers say, yes, we will loan you more money, but we want these birth certificates because we, own, we want to own and control these persons. Uh, and we will then collect taxes off of them. The average person is probably going to pay a certain amount of money per lifetime. And so they do an average, you know, what's this birth certificate worth? This person is probably worth, you know, so many hundred thousand dollars to us. And so they will loan money based on how many birth certificates they can get. The birth certificate is unnecessary to obtain. And you should not get one for your children when they're born. You can register the birth. You can notify them this child was born, but you don't need to get a birth certificate. Okay, so let's follow the yellow brick road here. God creates people. People create state government. State governments created the United States of America. Small u, capital S. Big difference here. The United States was created, which is the corporate United States. And very few people realize there's a vast difference between the two, okay? They created states. The states created persons. Up above the line, which is, represents a mirror, how many remember uh, Through the Looking Glass? Or uh, Dorothy? Not Dorothy. Uh, who was the one? Uh, Alice in Wonderland. Went through the Looking Glass. There's all symbolic stuff here, okay? Above the line is Kansas. This is the real world. Below the line is Oz. Remember when Dorothy got out of the house, she said, we're not in Kansas anymore. Well, and after about 1935 or 36 in America, we're not in Kansas anymore, folks. Now we're in Oz. Now, in Oz, Dorothy met several interesting people. <clears throat> First place, she had, in the, in the book, she had silver slippers. In the movie, she had ruby slippers, okay? She followed the yellow brick road, representing gold. Just the name of the city, Oz is gold, ounces, O-Z. Okay, <laughs> they spelled it out for us, oh, gold. In this, there were some people she dealt with. There was a straw man. 
No brain. That represents the artificial person created by you, by the government for you, with your name on it, but the names in all capital letters. Very important. Another fellow in there is called the Tin Man. The Tin Man in the movie represents commerce. He wants one thing. Remember the first words out of his mouth. they what? Oil. He's standing there rusting. I need oil, oil, you know. He, what doesn't he have? Tin Man doesn't have a heart. And commerce is ruthless. This is the way it is. You don't make it tough. Okay? Heartless. The lion, apparently, a cowardly lion, represents England, who that knew what was going on and didn't have the courage to do anything about it. I've got a great article on my in my file of billions of articles I have called The City, showing how that in England there's a financial district called The City in London. The Queen herself is not allowed to go in there without permission. This is the people that own the, the city, is the bankers, and they really run the world from the city. Nobody goes in there. I've heard that even the queen, when she goes in, has to go in dressed as a pauper because she has to borrow money from these bankers. Love of money, root of all evil. Okay. When they get to Oz, they find out there's this, they go in and there's this huge wizard. You know, he's got this big old face and the flames and the smoke and you know, the, the noise and all this stuff. At the end of the movie, they find out it's a little old man behind the curtain pulling some levers. Everybody's scared stiff of the Wizard of Oz. They find out it's all phony. There's so many illustrations you could make here. Satan does the same thing to the world. Everybody thinks, wow, look how powerful and how big Satan is. Well, he's a puny little man behind the curtain pulling some levers. And in the book of Ezekiel, it says, the people are, or in Isaiah or Ezekiel, people are going to say at the end, is this the man that made the nations to tremble? This is Satan? Oh, come on. you got to be kidding. Is Ezekiel 28? Ezekiel 28, yeah. Is this the man that made the nations to tremble? They're going to look narrowly upon him and say, you got to be kidding. This is him. <laughs> There's a little old man behind the curtain. Okay. So the straw man is called your corporate soul. Since the government created a corporate soul, they own it. Now, you have tied yourself to that straw man numerous ways. You've been using his social security number. You've been using his birth certificate to get things done. You've been using his driver's license. See, the straw man is owned by the government, so he's supposed to do all those things. They said, we want Kent Hoven, the straw man, to get a driver's license, to get a birth certificate, to get a marriage license, to get, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, this, this leaves you with four choices. Since they created a business in your name, you can, number one, do what they say, which moves you from right under God down to way at the bottom under the government. You are now a slave, because that's where the straw man is. Okay, he's way at the bottom of the totem pole. You can do what they say, which is what 90%, 95% of the people do. They don't know any better. They don't realize they're tied to this straw man because they've been using his name. Number two, you can cut the string and say, that's not me. That's, I'm not that person that you say. Many people do that very successfully. You've got to be careful, though, because they don't like the sheep getting out of the pasture because they intend to shear them once in a while. And so they're, they're pretty bad about this. I'll show you that in a minute, what one guy did in Canada. Choice number three, you can look for loopholes between the, the government and their straw man, and there are tons of loopholes. That's kind of what Erwin Schiff does in his, his, his take on you know, the, looking for loopholes, and there's lots of them, legitimate loopholes. Okay. Choice number four is just redeem that straw man. Send a notice to the government saying, look, you've been doing business in my name. I'm laying claim to that account, that straw man account. I'm redeeming it. I'm claiming it for me. And then you give them notice. If I don't hear from you within 20 days with a good reason of why I shouldn't do this, look, I'm going to assume you have no reason. And by their silence, they admit Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule Number 4, I believe it is. If you make a statement to the government and they don't rebut it, it stands as true. So you claim, that's mine. There's your rebuttal. They don't respond. It's now yours. And that's called redeeming the straw man, which, is, which I have done and anybody can do. We end up signing contracts that make us slaves of the government. Who gives the authority to get married? Where does the right to marry come from? God. God. Why do we ask the state's permission then to do that? Suppose I decided... I could, suppose I could trick all of you into getting my permission to drive on the highway. 
If you came and you said, Brother Hovind, can I drive on the highway? I'd say, well, yeah, I want to make sure you're safe, you know, so I want you to take a little test first. I want to see if you can drive well. And then if you'll give me 50 bucks, I'll issue you a, a driver's license so that you can drive on the highway. And you go through the rest of your life thinking, wow, Brother Hovind gave me permission. See, I got permission right here to drive on the highway. <laughs> you don't need my permission to drive on the highway. <laughs> you can drive on it anyway. But if you're dumb enough to give me 50 bucks, I'll take it. And if you want to put yourself under my authority, well, come on under. Everybody's welcome, okay? But you'd be a fool to do that. Since God gives the right to get married, if you go to the state and ask for their permission to get married, to get a marriage license, can you give your marriage covenant? Yeah, grab that for me, would you please? If you get a marriage license, you have now asked the state for permission to do something that God already told you you can do. And you have now put yourself down with that straw man. Interesting thing happens, once you get attached to this straw man, you become under all those rules and regulations and you carry the burden of everything above you. You don't have to get a marriage license. If you do get a marriage license, that is a contract between you and the wife or husband and the state. The fine print of the contract gives them permission to take your kids away if they don't like the way you're raising them. One friend of mine uh, had a girl in his church, she was 12 years old I believe, and mom spanked her one night for doing something, you know. And she got all huffy and got mad at mom, you know. Next day she goes to school, she's still mad at mom. And one of her friends says, hey, you want to get your mom in trouble? Call the welfare department. <clears throat> That'll fix them. Claim you were abused, child abuse. Well, the idiot 12-year-old did. Called the welfare department, you know, <laughs> claim child abuse. They came out and really hassled that family. And once you get the welfare department on your case, you can't hardly get them off. Okay. The girl felt sorry for what's happening. She, she wrote a letter and said, look, I'm sorry, I lied, it wasn't true, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Didn't matter. Welfare's on your case, boy, you're done. They want to come inspect your house every week, and et cetera, et cetera, you know. So they asked the pastor, they said, pastor, what do we do? And he said, well, do you have a marriage license? They said, well, yeah. He said, there's your problem right there. That license gives them the authority to come in your house and take away your kids if they don't like the way you're raising them. They said, well, how do we get out of this? He said, well, you signed a contract. Now, you probably didn't know that the contract was uh, by fraud, and so you can redeem uh, this, you can get out of this mess by simply filling out a little paper, just write out a little sentence that says, I hereby revoke, uh, renege, rescind, annul, disallow, all these legal terms, my signature on my marriage license. Go down to the courthouse and have it file stamped, cost you five bucks or six bucks, and it'll go into your file, as you have, at this date, annulled, disallowed your signature on your marriage license. Now, that doesn't mean you're not married anymore, but it means they, now long, they no longer now have authority. So when this family did that, welfare department left them alone. Have no authority anymore. If a Mexican police officer showed up at my door, said, Mr. Hovind, we've got a law in Mexico that says you can't do whatever, and he saw you driving across Pensacola and you broke one of our laws. Yeah? What's your point, sir? Well, come with me, you're under arrest. <laughs> no, sir, I'm sorry. You have no authority here. You're a Mexican police officer. Your authority stops at the border. You have no authority here. That was the big deal during moonshine days. They would run for the county line to get away from the revenuers because he had only had authority in a certain area. It all goes back to who has authority, who's in charge anyway. So a driver's license, a marriage license, a social security card are three of the primary contracts we have made. Now, if you want to get out of those contracts, simple to do. Okay. Pastor Mooneyhan, who is the pastor of the church that our ministry is under, has a, called a freedom package. Yeah, that's his phone number right there. It's like 50 bucks for the freedom package. If you want to get it, it's 352-498-0384. Uh, and he can give you this freedom package of what forms to fill out and get you out of all these contracts you've gotten yourself into that you did not realize you got yourself into. So that might be something you would uh, want to consider. And he can help you with all the details. I don't have time to mess with it. All right? I'm not afraid of the subject. I just don't have time to mess with it. Okay. Bruce, a uh, friend of mine up in Canada, this is a letter he wrote. It's on my website. At the, Jeff, at the last couple pages of that article you have there, is, is, that's the article off my website, but is this letter, okay? Bruce in Canada decided, you know, God gave me the authority to drive. Why do I need the Canadian government's permission? And he got to study in this straw man issue and said, look, they created a straw man and they regulate him, but they don't regulate me. I'm a natural born citizen. 
Here's a letter that he wrote. I've got them all on my website. It's fascinating. He says, Hi, folks. I went to court this morning, driven by a good friend, Don Scully. I really didn't know what to expect and had determined not to argue for my rights. But if I need to be, if need be, to simply state from Scripture why I could no longer... I could not any longer accept and acknowledge a fictitious driver's license in the name of a fictitious legal person. The straw man. Number two, be surety for the debts of others, prover uh, contrary to Proverbs, uh, by having auto insurance policy. Because you are now surety for somebody else's debts. That's the way he felt about it. Number three, uh, he, he, anyway, bottom line is he gave up his driver's license, his license plates, and his insurance. Sent them to the government said, I'm sorry, I got these by fraud. I didn't realize this is for a, this is for an artificial person. It's not for me. Sure enough, he got stopped. Given tickets, you know, no driver's license, no license plates, etc. Here's the letter. Let's go on here. To be honest with you, I went to court with very little faith and anticipated that the judge would not listen to what I had to say and would probably levy the fines. The minimum fine for the insurance charge was $5,000. So I expected I'd probably have to go to jail as I simply don't have money like that. When my name was called, I stood outside the gate, refused to enter into the jurisdiction of the court, and asked the judge, and stated to the judge, that I was the natural person, Williford Bruce Woodford. Let me back up here and show you this. He stayed outside the gate. Go to any courtroom and you'll see they've got the judge and the jury and the two tables for the lawyers and a little gate, a little rail. Why do they have the little railing in there? That represents the edge of a ship. When you cross over that railing, you have entered the judge's martial military law, maritime law. So if you don't go inside that gate, they have no jurisdiction over you. So he stayed outside the gate, very wise. He stood up. He said, Judge, I'm a natural person, Bruce Woodford, or Wilford Bruce Woodford. And that it was my understanding that all the three defendants in the case before him, failure to surrender a driver's license, driving without a valid light permit, and driving without insurance, were legal persons with which I have nothing to do. At that point, the judge motioned with his finger for me to step forward so I can hear you better. Yeah, right. He wants to get him inside that gate. <laughs> I, he want, uh, I simply ignored him and reiterated that I was a natural person to whom the offense notices had been delivered, but that I was not the legal persons named as defendants. That being the case, I asked the judge if there was any further need of my presence in the courtroom. He said, wait a minute, let me consider what has been said. He was silent for some time and fingered through the papers before him. Then he spoke about this legal person I had referred to. He read the three charges and asked me if I was not the one who was alleged to have committed these offenses. Again, I replied that I was a natural person and that the Dictionary of Canada, Canadian Law clearly distinguishes between natural persons and legal persons. At that point, he said, if you are sure you are not the person to whom are named in these charges, you are free to leave. But, he continued, I have two options before me. If you are the person named, your driver's license will be suspended. To which I responded, sir, I have no driver's license. <laughs> Number two, I can order the police officer who laid these charges to arrest the person against whom these charges were laid. If you are not that person, you have nothing to fear, you are free to go. And so I left. <laughs> Since then, they've had him back into court twice, and he's, he laughs about it now because he goes in there and he knows they have nothing they can do to him. He just shows up just to, just to see what's going to happen. All of his letters back and forth between the judges are on my website and at the end of that article, if you want to get that. Okay. That's uh, Bruce, uh, uh, Bruce Woodford. Anyway, he has taken the approach of, look, that ain't me. That's a straw man. That doesn't apply to me. Okay. If the term United States is written out with both capital letters, that is referring to the federal entity defined by Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. This is Washington, D.C. So, if somebody says, are you a citizen of the United States? And you sign yes under penalty of perjury, you're claiming you live in Washington, D.C. Now, Washington, D.C. <coughs> is not one of the 50 states. They are under a very different set of rules and regulations. They could pass any rules they wanted in Washington, D.C. So if you're claiming you live in Washington, D.C. under penalty of perjury, well, then they're going to assume the law applies to you. If a Mexican police officer showed up at my door and said, Mr. Hoven, are you a Mexican citizen? 
They put a paper in front of me says, sign this to swear you're a Mexican citizen and you will abide by the Mexican laws. Well, if I'm dumb enough to sign that paper, yes, under penalty of perjury, <laughs> okay, I just put myself under Mexican law. And if you sign a paper under penalty of perjury, that yes, I'm a citizen of capital U, capital S, you just put yourself in Washington, D.C. I don't live in Washington, D.C. I don't even like to go to the place, okay? <laughs> I sure don't want to live there. <laughs> and I definitely don't want to be a citizen of it, okay? If it is a small U, capital S. Now, that's one of the 50 states. I fly all over the world. I've been to 26 countries doing my seminars on creation and more coming. Um, invariably, I get on the airplane, I'm flying over to the country, and they say, you've got to fill out this paper to get in, you know. And invariably, on that paper, it says, are you a citizen of the United States? And it's capital U, capital S. So I simply take out my pen, cross out the capital U, write in the small u, and I add the words of America. Small u, United States, of America. And sign it, yes, I'm a citizen of that, sure. The average guy looking at these forms, he doesn't, he doesn't catch what I did, I'm sure. But I don't want to claim to be a citizen of Washington, D.C. For one thing, I'm not. And if I did, I'd be under all sorts of rules that I don't want to be under. I got enough rules to obey, okay? I got enough rules right here to obey that I'm not, not doing all of those. <laughs> I should not want to be under their laws. So United States citizens are actually citizens of the District of Columbia, if it's capital U, capital S. Now, if it's all capital letters, this is referring to the Philippines. See, they've tricked us by using certain words. Suppose I wrote out a document, and I said, at the very beginning, I said, in this document, the word up means down. I could do that, couldn't I? Then I can write a big, long story, and every time I say the word up, it really means down, right? At the beginning of the IRS code, it says, United States means District of Columbia. And then all the rest of this stuff is for them. It's not for me. <laughs> Unless I claim to live there. Oh, now it applies to me. So they're going to trap you. Somehow, they're going to try to trap you into being part of Washington, D.C., because that's what this applies to. If you want to live in Washington, D.C., or be subject to their laws, enjoy yourself. I don't want to be subject to those laws. If it's just United States, that's talking about the District of Columbia. It can be written several different ways. Capital U, capital S, or all capital letters means the same thing. It's District of Columbia. So the rich men, and the Bible talks a lot about the, the go to ye rich men, weep and howl for the miseries that shall come upon you. You know, uh, the love of money, root of all evil. The Bible talks a lot about that. Okay? They trick people into getting a social security number in order to get benefits from the government. They created a crisis. This is the technique they've used for centuries. Create a crisis so that you can accomplish some particular goal. Remember, Nero wanted to get rid of the Christians. So, set the city on fire. Burned Rome down and blamed it on the Christians. Hitler wanted gun control. Yeah. Hitler wanted gun control, so he blew up the Reichstag, the federal building of the German government. Blew it up. He said, wow, look, terrorist attack. We need more gun control. The, the militias were growing like crazy in America after what happened at Waco. And they had gun control legislation that was stalled in Congress. People were scared of their government, and rightfully so. And they're trying to get more gun control regulation passed. And so the federal government blew up Oklahoma City mirror building to blame it on the militia. If you watch my video number five, we've got a whole bunch of footage on there from the news footage right after, have you seen that, haven't you, Eric? Right after the bombing, for the next few hours, the cameramen are all swarming all over the place. And they say, we can't go in the building yet. They just brought out bomb number three. Oh, folks, they just discovered another bomb unexploded. That news footage, I've got it all, okay? telling about the bombs they were bringing out of the building that had not exploded. And who got blamed for that? Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh with a truck bomb in the street. First place, anybody knows anything about explosives will tell you there's no way a truck bomb is going to shear the pillars off. You might blow the walls out, you know, blow the walls out or break all the windows. But you don't cut the pillars off. They're, they're, the people who blow up buildings for a living, you know, have a hard time. They got to very carefully engineer. Put the explosive right on the pillar. 
they drill a bunch of holes in the pillar, put the explosives in just the right place, you know, to cut that thing off. <laughs> After the building was blown up, it wasn't very long, the rest of the building was demolished. You don't ever destroy evidence at a crime scene. All of this rubble is hauled off to a dump, and an armed guard is posted on the dump. Well, why do you need a guard to dump, sir? They're afraid somebody might dig up that garbage and find out the pillars were sheared off by C4, C4 plastic explosives, and that the federal government actually blew up that building for numerous reasons. It sure did get the gun control through Congress. I mean, it passed right away. All you need is a crisis to make an excuse to do some illegal activity. So the depression was created intentionally, create the crisis, so that people will accept what you're trying to give them, a number. That's what happened. Here's a Social Security card that my wife got when she was a child. I changed the numbers on here, okay? Notice what it says at the bottom. For Social Security and tax purposes, not for identification. Interesting. Did you know you were not allowed to use your Social Security card for identification purposes? Well, what do they always ask for now for identification purposes? Social Security number. It said not for identification. Here's, here's the new card. Oh no, it doesn't say that anymore. The new card does not say that. But on the back of this new card, there's a number. Again, I changed the numbers on here, okay? The C1234566. This is the bank account number in Washington, D.C., where the straw man's money is kept. That's the account number. If you have a card that's been issued since 1992, it'll look like this, dark blue. Look on the back. There's your bank account number that they deal through. There's a regular account with your straw man name on it. And they're doing business in your name through this straw man account. And there's the number. What some people have done, uh, with varying degrees of success, and I don't understand all about this, but Ernie Land does, and uh, John D.R.C. does, and their names are listed in that article right there. They sent in a notice and said, look, that straw man belongs to me. I claim it. The government doesn't respond. And so, for the rest of their life, if they ever get a bill from the government, they pay it through their straw man account. Suppose the government gives you a ticket for speeding. Well, the Constitution says, you know, you can't be, your property cannot be taken away without due process, and there has to be an injured party. Well, who did you injure by speeding? Nobody. Now, if you do injure somebody by speeding, you should pay for it according to Scripture. Okay? If you hurt somebody, you make it good. So you might want to think about that. But the fact is, you didn't injure anybody. So you get stopped to give your ticket 50 bucks. And you're such a nice guy. You say, listen, you know, the Bible says if someone compels you to go a mile, go two. If he asks for your coat, give him your cloak also. You ask for 50 bucks, you take the ticket, you write right across the face. We've got a, a stamp that we use for this. You know? <laughs> or no, a, an overlay we put and we, we copy through the copy machine. It says, accepted for value. And I write in the amount, okay? I accept this $50 this $50 ticket you just gave me, and I'm going to give you $300 out of my straw man account. So I send a letter, and along with this copy of this ticket, and accepted for value, you know, I send all this to Robert Rubin, Secretary of the Treasury, Washington, D.C., and says, you know, I want you to pay this, the county, $300 out of my straw man account. Well, Robert Rubin now has a problem because their books won't balance. The ticket's only for 50. I'm wanting to give them 300. What about this extra 250 bucks? How does he balance the books? Well, he takes it out of the local sheriff's operating fund <laughs> to balance the books. So it cost them 250 bucks to give me that ticket. IRS sends you a bill, 1,000 bucks. Yours is 1,000 bucks. Oh, listen, I don't want to fight anybody. Look, you want my cloak? Here, I'll give you my coat. I'll give you everything. I'll give you 5,000 out of this straw man account, which has... It starts off with $1.6 million when you're born. That's what they put in it, okay, to do business out of this account. And I don't know a lot more about it than that, okay? So you'd want to get with uh, John D'Arcy or with Ernie Land on, the, on my website to get more information on that. But that's the account number, and it works. 
Tennessee, uh, governor of Tennessee, I believe, or someone, sent letters to a bunch of the police officers and said, would you please stop giving tickets to these patriots because we can't afford this. It's costing us a fortune to give out these tickets. What about the account for the older car? I don't know. I don't, I don't know where that is or was. You can get a new card, though. You yeah, you walk in and get a new card. Anybody can. They'll give it to you. Okay? New ones don't say that. Okay? The account number for your uh, debt account is on the back. People say, you have to have a Social Security number. No, you don't. I do everything without a Social Security number. Go to the, go to the post office, pick up this form to get drafted. Selective service, you know. Look what it says. In yellow. Block 3. If you have a Social Security number account, Social Security account number, it is mandatory that you include this information. If you don't have one, leave this block blank. Well, what does that tell me? I don't have to have one. Wouldn't you assume that's what it's saying? <laughs> Certainly. Do you have to sign up for Selective Service? I don't know if you have to sign up for Selective Service or not. You can if you want to, but that's a good question. Probably Ernie would know that, or John D'Arcy would know that. Yeah, those, those guys are up on all that's a little out of my field of expertise but I like studying about it it's fascinating you know but uh, I'm, they're, they're much more knowledgeable on the topic than I am Taco Bell was sued because they refused to hire a kid because he would not divulge his social security number he said that's private information it's none of your business what my social security number is according to the law you are only required to give your social security number if you are applying for social security benefits Nobody else is allowed to demand that from you. Now, if a bank won't open a bank account, the Amish don't, have, don't even have Social Security numbers. They have bank accounts. They do everything just like we do. They just simply say it's against my religious convictions. Oh, okay. Open the account. You can sue a bank for discriminating against you if they refuse to open it. It has to be a non-interest-bearing checking account, okay? Because the banks are tied in with the Federal Reserve all works together. If you want to put your money in their bank and earn interest on it, well, then you better play by their game. But as long as you're not earning interest, you just want them to hold your money for you because you don't want to keep it under the mattress. You're afraid somebody might break into the house, okay? Or for convenience, <coughs> you're willing to pay them 10 cents a piece or 20 cents a piece every time you write a check. It's much more convenient to write checks than to carry cash around. Perfectly fine. But if they demand a number of you before they do that, you can sue them. Now, most people don't know this, and most people don't want to go through the hassle, and so they just go get a number. But it is totally voluntary. If you want to get out of a Social Security card, get out of a Social Security contract, check my website. It's now question number 40, but the number changes all the time. Uh, FAQ on my website. That's that paper you have there in front of you. Tell us a little bit about Social Security. So the Federal Reserve, if you want to know more about the Federal Reserve and what happened, this is an excellent book to, to read. Bill Still. Uh, do we have this book in our... It's 15 bucks or something. There's his phone number. Uh, I believe he's in Oklahoma. Um, if you really want to get a clear picture of what the Federal Reserve is, it's not federal, any more than Federal Express is federal. Okay, it's a private bunch of bankers that control our currency, and our Congress and Senate and President is scared stiff of the Federal Reserve. They run the show. Okay? This is an... We have to be careful because you're dealing with a, with a beast, the Federal Reserve. I don't think you need to be scared. If you have redeemed the straw man, well, yeah, that really helps because now you have laid claim. You, remember the movie The Matrix? You know, you want the red pill or the blue pill? <laughs> Some people are better off just taking the blue pill and go back to bed. If you want the red pill and you really want to understand what's going on, you probably, you know, you know I'll show you The Matrix. You might want to... Um, study some of these books to comprehend what's going on, because we have been trapped, okay? Just absolutely duped. You can't even pay bills anymore. You can't discharge a debt, because you're giving them Federal Reserve notes. You're not paying cash for it. You're paying a note. So no debts have been paid, unless you bought it with silver or gold, since 1935 or six, whenever they did that. Khrushchev used to brag that he got all of his secrets from Rockefeller. Rockefeller started the CIA, which is the, from Russia you got the KGB, same thing. <laughs> CIA is the American KGB. Um, Rockefeller started that. They took our gold, gave us paper. Next they're going to take away the paper, give us plastic, and then they'll take away the plastic and give us a mark in the hand. This spring, in Pensacola, 
money will not be accepted. You want to go get a Coke, hamburger? Doesn't matter. You have to have a debit card. PCC's done that for a couple years now, haven't they? It works great. It's a good system in many ways, but this is all forerunner to the Mark of the Beast type stuff. You want to get information on the Mark of the Beast, the little microchip and all that stuff? You know, Carl Sanders is one of the guys who invented it. He built it. He travels all over and speaks on the topic. He's been here. Uh, we videotape quite a bit of information with Carl Sanders. Great godly man. Uh, there's this uh, email is shofar, S-H-O-P-H-A-R, at trumpetmen.org. Trumpet Ministries is what he calls his organization, up in Leslie, Arkansas. Dean Martin here in Pensacola, good friend of ours, uh, has lots of information on that. Terry Cook is, uh, uh, wrote this book here, The Mark of the New World Order. Gary Fry in North Carolina is a good friend of mine, has lots of information on this Mark of the Beast microchip type stuff if you want to get more on that. Okay, next week we'll finish up talking about uh, money, Mondex Corporation, how it all ties in, and then fin try to finish with the Communist Manifesto and go on to how this is all part of a bigger plan for Satan to have a one world government, a new world order. Some people get upset with me because they even mention all this IRS type stuff in my seminar. They say, you should talk just about creation. Well, it all ties together. If God's the creator, then he's the boss. Now, if you want to give yourself to become a straw man underneath, you know, and you don't want to be under God, well, you do whatever you want. Okay? But I want to be uh, a sovereign citizen under God. I'm not lawless. I think everybody should obey the law. I'm trying real hard to understand it and obey it. And if they tell me, United States means Washington, D.C., and then they go on for 4,000 pages talking about what you're supposed to do, I don't care. <laughs> it's not me. If you want to be there, fine, enjoy yourself, you know. Good luck understanding it. <laughs> that thing ought to be void for vagueness, you know. A lot of people have declared that. Anyway, we'll cover more on that next week. Thank you.